Hi, and welcome to the Rapid Review Lecture Series by UIMS. My name is Rima Muaddin, and I'm a sixth year medical student at the Second Faculty of Medicine. Today, I'm going to talk about the pathology of the female and the male reproductive system. So first, I'm going to start with the female reproductive system, and we're going to talk about the vulva, vagina, cervix, endometrium, ovaries, and gestational pathology. And as for the male reproductive system, we'll be talking about the penis and the scrotum, testicles, and the prostate. So the pathology of the vulva, I'll start with the Bartholin cyst. It's a unilateral painful cystic dilatation of the Bartholin gland. And it happens in women over 40 years old and can lead to an abscess. The inflammation causes a blockage. So that causes an accumulation of the secretions from the glands, which causes a cyst formation. Next I'll be talking about is a condyloma. It's a painless genital wart that can be caused by more than more commonly by HPV 6 and 11, also known as condyloma acuminatum, or less commonly by syphilis, but causes condyloma latum, and it rarely progresses to cancer. Next, we have uh, extra mammary Paget's disease. It's basically the presence of malignant epithelial cells in the epidermis of the vulva, which is basically carcinoma in situ. There usually isn't any underlying malignancy. If the patient has Paget's disease in the nipple, then there is some kind of cancer somewhere in the breast. But if they have extra mammary Paget's disease of the vulva, then there's no underlying cancer. It presents with erythematous pruritus and uh, eczematous lesion around the vulva. Other pathologies of the vulva include lichen sclerosis and lichen simplex chronicus. Lichen sclerosis is when the vulva epidermis thins and fibrosis, and this happens in the dermis. It's caused by um, an autoimmune etiology and it presents with leukoplakia and parchment thin-like vulvar skin. It's most commonly in menopausal women and it's benign but has an increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. Whereas the lichen simplex chronicus is hyperplasia of the vulvar squamous epithelium and it's uh, caused by chronic irritation and scratching. This also presents as leukoplakia, but with very thick and very leathery vulvar skin. It happens at any age, usually in young women. It's benign, but has no increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. Now onto vulval carcinoma. It's relatively rare seen in women of reproductive age or above 70 years old. It, the etiologies can be HPV 16 and 18, and it arises from VIN or it can be non-HPV ETLG, which arises from long-standing long -standing lichen sclerosis, usually in women above 70 years old. It also presents with leukoplakia and the biopsy is needed to distinguish from other causes of leukoplakia. Next, we have pathology of the vagina. I'll start with vaginal adenosis, which is basically persistence of the columnar epithelial cells in the upper part of the vagina. As we both know that the vagina is um, non-keratizing non squamous cell uh, epithelium. And during development, the vagina arises from two structures. The upper two third is from the Mullerian duct and has columnar cells. And the lower one third comes from the urogenital sinus and has stratified squamous epithelium. However, during development, the columnar cells are rapidly uh, replaced by stratified squamous epithelium. But if this doesn't happen, then this causes vaginal adenosis. It can also be caused by the use of diethyl uh, besterol, diethyl still besterol, which is given in utero to reduce pregnancy complications. And it can progress to clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Next, we have embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. And this is a highly malignant proliferation of the immature skeletal muscle cells, so rhabdomyoblasts. It's a rare cancer seen in children below five years old and it presents with bleeding and a grape-like mass protruding from the vagina or the penis called an, uh, sarcoma botroides. And you can see the picture of it here. Uh, so next we have vaginal carcinoma. Uh, this is a malignant proliferation of squamous uh, epithelium lining the vaginal canal. It's caused by HPV serotypes 16, 18, 31, and 33. It arises from its precursor lesion, VIN, which is vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia. The cancer in the upper one-third uh, spreads to the inguinal lymph nodes, and the lower two-thirds spreads to the iliac lymph nodes. 
Next, I'll talk about cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. This is very high yield. CIN is a pre-malignant pre epithelial dysplasia that is characterized by choleocytic changes, nuclear atypia, and high mitotic activity. It can progress to carcinoma in situ and invasive, invasive squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, although it's not inevitable. So we have three grades of dysplasia, and it's based on the extent of immature dysplastic cells. Uh, grade one involves one third of the thickness of the epithelium, and it's usually very mild or uh, mild dysplasia. CIN2 involves two third of the thickness of the epithelium, which is moderate dysplasia, and CIN3 involves the entire thickness of the epithelium. And then it moves on to carcinoma in situ, which involves the entire thickness of the epithelium, but has not invaded that basement membrane. This is high yield because once it does invade the basement membrane, then it becomes invasive carcinoma, which is so CIN 1, 2, and 3 are reversible, but carcinoma in situ is irreversible. Next, I'll be talking about HPV because it's very high yield um, in this topic. So it's a viral infection that mostly, affect, that mostly affects the lower genital tract, especially the transformation zone of the cervix. This infection can be eradicated either after an acute inflammation by your body, or the infection can persist leading to cervical dysplasia or CIN. And this is the most common cause of squamous cell carcinoma of the genitourinary tract. It produces two proteins, which are E6 and E7. E6 inactivates CP53 and E7 inactivates RB. So HPV can be prevented by vaccinations. HB's, HPV 6 and 11 uh, vaccines can be used to prevent condyloma acuminatum. And HPV 16 and 18 uh, vaccines can be used to prevent against CIN and cervical cancer. However, serotypes 31 and 33 are not covered by the vaccine and therefore pap smears are still important and they're still needed. HPV is screened for either by a viral DNA or RNA PCR test or by a pap smear. The histologic hallmark of HPV infections are coleocytes, as you can see here, which can be uh, visualized by a pap smear. Next, I have cervical carcinoma. It's the third most common type of gynecological cancer. The development of cervical carcinoma is preceded by the premalignant epithelial dysplasia, CIN, which I just talked about. The two main types are squamous cell carcinoma, which happens in 80% of the cases, or adenocarcinoma, or 15% of the cases. It's mostly seen in middle-aged women 40 to 50 years old or 20 years after an HPV infection or if you're immunosuppressed, like for example, with AIDS. It presents with postcoital bleeding, pelvic pain, and abnormal vaginal discharge. And the most common cause of death is renal failure in these patients. And this is because of hydronephrosis. This is because um, the uterus, the cancer invades through the anterior wall of the uterine into the bladder, causing obstruction, obstruction of the uterus, ureters. So how do we diagnose cervical cancer? The goal is to catch the CIN before it develops into a carcinoma, because once it does, then it's irreversible. And this takes about 10 to 20 years. So you can be screened uh, for it by the pap smear, which is a cytological screening test for cervical cancer in which a sample is taken from the cervix and examined for cellular abnormalities that may be indicative of cervical cancer. And the pap smear is indicated in um, women who are 25 to 65 years old every three years or every five years old as co-testing with HPV DNA tests if you're a high-risk patient. After a screening test, the confirmatory test is a colposcopy, which is a procedure using a colposcope to examine the cervix, vagina, vulva, and anus for precancerous lesions or abnormalities. The procedure allows to magnify the visual field of the epithelium and to guide a biopsy sample for the histological diagnosis. As you can see these two pictures, the first one is the pap smear and the second one is the colposcopy. Next, we'll talk about endometriitis. It can be acute or chronic, and it's basically a bacterial infection. For acute, it's a bacterial infection of the endometrium, and it's caused usually due to a retained product of 
conception, for example, if you leave a piece of placenta during delivery or after a miscarriage. It presents as fever, ab abnormal uterine bleeding, and pelvic pain. Chronic endometriitis causes uh, chronic inflammation of the endometrium and is characterized by the presence of plasma cells and lymphocytes. And plasma cells is key for diagnosis. It's caused also by retained products of conception. It's caused by IUDs or PID, which is pelvic inflammatory disease, which can be caused by gonorrhea or chlamydia. It also presents as abnormal uterine bleeding, pain, and infertility. Next, I'll talk about adenomyosis, which is a benign disease characterized by the occurrence of endometrial tissue within the myometrium due to the hyperplasia of the endometrial basal layer. Its peak incidence is at 35 to 50 years old, and the exact etiology is unknown, although there are some risk factors that have been identified. So the first risk factor is endometriosis. They usually can occur together or separately. Uterine fibroids, fibroids and multiparities, meaning you've had more than one uh, childbirth or pregnancy. So this presents as dysmenorrhea, abnormal uterine bleeding, chronic pelvic pain, but can also be asymptomatic. It can be diagnosed clinically and is supported by a transvaginal ultrasound, and the histology is what confirms the diagnosis. Treatment can be conservative with uh, things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or, and oral contraceptives, or if those are not working, then you would go for a surgical option such as a hysterectomy. Next, we have gestational pathology. The first one I'll be talking about is uh, ectopic pregnancy. Um, it's basically when you have an implantation of the fertilized ovum at a site other than the uterine wall, most commonly in the fallopian tube. And a key risk factor is scarring, which is most likely secondary due to PID or endometriosis. It presents as lower quadrant abdominal pain a few weeks after you've missed the period. It is a surgical emergency as it causes extreme heavy bleeding and rupture of the fallopian tube. So it can cause death very quickly. The second is spontaneous abortion. And this is when you have a, a abortion when uh, you are less than 20 weeks of gestation. It's quite common uh, and it occurs uh, in one fourth of all pregnancies. It presents as vaginal bleeding with pass passage of fetal tissue, I'm sorry, that's a typo. It's fetal tissue and cramp-like pain. Caused most often due to chromosomal aberrations, congenital infections, and exposure to teratogens. So placental pathologies include, uh, we have placenta previa, placenta abruption, placenta accreta, increta, and percreta. So placenta previa is when the placenta implants uh, close to the cervical opening, and it can cause fetal distress as it exits because it compresses the placenta, which is the main source of the oxygen and of the blood. It presents as painless third trimester bleeding. It often requires C -section, uh, a C-section delivery. Placenta abruption is a partial or complete separation of the placenta from the uterus before the delivery. If it detaches, then you lose the baby so baby's source of oxygen, causing distress. Hypertension, preeclampsia, and eclampsia are the predisposing factors. It also presents as uh, it presents as painful third trimester bleeding and fetal insufficiency. So placenta accreta is when the placenta implants onto the myometrium but does not penetrate. It causes abnormal uterine bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage. Any prior damage to the endometrium is a um, risk factor. The uh, mnemonic that I use to remember this is placenta accreta attaches to the myometrium. And then we have placenta increta. Placenta imp it's when the placenta implants into the myometrium, but with penetration. It also causes abnormal uterine bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage. And any prior damage to the endometrium is a risk factor. The mnemonic I use for this one is placenta increta invades the myometrium. And as for placenta percreta, it's when the, it implants 
with penetration of the myometrium serosa and sometimes of the adjacent organs. It also um, presents as abnormal uterine bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage. Any prior damage to the endometrium is also a risk factor. And the way I remember it is placenta per creta perforates the myometrium. Next, we'll talk about hydatiform mole. It's basically an abnormal conception characterized by swollen and edematous villi with proliferation of the trophoblasts. Risk factors include prior molar pregnancies, history of miscarriage, or if the patient is less than 15 years old or more than 35 years old. Uh, choriocarcinoma may arise after that, so it does have a malignancy um, risk. So it can be either partial or complete. So for partial is when you have a normal ovum that's fertilized by two sperms. So that causes 69 chromosomes. That's obviously incompatible with life. You do have fetal tissue present in this type and you have a minimal risk for choriocarcinoma and you have low beta HCG. Whereas in the complete form, it's the ovum, that, it's the ovum that's empty and it's fertilized by two sperms and it also has 69 chromosomes. You have absent fetal tissue and it has a higher risk for choriocarcinoma and a higher beta HCG. Next, we have ovarian pathology. First thing I'm going to talk about is PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome as it's quite common in women. And it's basically the presence of polycystic ovaries and it's characterized by hyperandrogenism, oligoovulation or anovulation. So the prevalence is six to 12% of women in their reproductive years. What you have basically is high LH that stimulates the theca cells to pr produce lots of androgens. And increased androgens, um, androgen production in the ovarian theca internal cells causes an imbalance between the androgen precursors and the resulting estrogen produced by the granulosa cells. And the high LH secretion disrupts, disrupts the LH and FSH balance. This causes impaired follicle maturation with cyst formation due to the lack of follicular rupture. And this causes anovulation or oligovulation, which causes infertility. It presents as menstrual irregularities such as amenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, or menorrhagia. It also causes insulin resistance. It causes skin conditions such as hirsutism and psychiatric conditions such as depression and anxiety. The diagnostic test for this would show increased testosterone due to the androgens and an LH is to FSH ratio of higher than two is to one. PCOS patients have a higher risk of endometrial carcinoma due to the unopposed estrogen and lack of progesterone. Now we'll talk about ovarian tumors. So what are the types of ovarian tumors? There are three, they're um, divided based on their cell types, which are surface epithelium, germ cells, and sex cord stroma. Each cell can give uh, a type of tumor. For the surface uh, epithelium, the common ones are the serous tumor, which are filled with water and they're uh, associated with the BRCA1 mutation or the mucinous tumor, which are filled with mucin. And less commonly, we have endometrioid and Brenner tumors. Um, the serous and the mucinous tumors are the most common ovarian tumors, more than 70%, and they have the worst prognosis of all the female genital tra tract cancers, as they're often detected quite late. It presents with vague abdominal discomfort or signs of bladder compression or urinary frequency. Next, we have um, germ cells, and the tumor subtypes are based on the tissue made by the germ cells. So for oocytes, we have the germinoma, and it's the most common malignant germ cell tumor. Placental tissue cor causes choriocarcinoma. Fetal tissue gives rise to embryonal carcinoma or cystic teratoma. And yolk sac gives rise to endodermal or yolk sac tumor. Um, Next, we have sex cord stroma, which can be uh, tumors of the granulosa theca cells or sertoli Leydig cells or of the fibros fibroblasts. So um, surface epithelial tumors can be uh, classified into benign, borderline, and malignant. 
Benign are also known as cystoadenoma, and they have a single cyst with simple flat lining, and it's mostly seen in premenopausal women. Borderline is the uh, between the benign and the malignant, and it has uh, better prognosis than the malignant, but has malignant potential as well. And the malignant are also known as cysto cystoadenocarcinoma, and it's a complex cyst with thick shaggy lining. And this is mostly seen in postmenopausal women. So we're going to go a little bit in detail about the germ cell tumors. The dysgerminoma is a malignant tumor with cells that resemble oocytes, like a fried egg appearance. These are malignant. Uh, this is a malignant tumor, and it's the most common malignant germ cell tumor. And the seminoma is the male counterpart, which we'll talk about later. Uh, it has a good prognosis and a response to radiotherapy a therapy, and serum LDH may be elevated. Choriocarcinoma is also a malignant tumor composed of cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts. Uh, this is also malignant as the trophoblasts are very invasive. It has a poor response to chemotherapy and has high beta HCG characteristics due to the syncytiotrophoblasts uh, making it. Uh, next, we have embryonal carcinoma, which is a malignant tumor composed of large primitive cells, and it's malignant and quite aggressive. And then we have cystic teratoma, which is a tumor made up of fetal tissue derived from two, from more than two embryonic layer, layers, for example, skin, hair, cartilage, and so on. It's mostly benign, but if it's immature tissue, then it can cause uh, some sort of malignancy. So it does have a malignant potential and it's the most common germ cell tumor as well. Um, so you can find hair, teeth uh, and things like that inside the cystic teratoma as you can see in this picture. Next we have endodermal uh, sinus or yolk sac tumor and this is also a malignant tumor that mimics yolk sac. It's malignant and it's the most common germ cell tumor in kids. In histology you see Schiller Duval bodies and uh, which are glomerulus-like structures. So all of them are malignant except for the cystic teratoma, although it does have a malignant potential. Next, we have sex cord tumors, and they're basically um, sex cord stromal tissue of ovary uh, tumors. So first one, we have granulosa theca cell tumor. It's the tumor of the granulosa and theca cells. It's malignant, but minimum risk of metastasis. And it, uh, its presentation is based on excess estrogen production. So you have uh, prior to pu puberty, you have precocious puberty, which is early puberty. Uh, at reproductive age, you have menorrhagia and metororrhagia. And during the menopause period, you have endometrial hyperplasia with postmenopausal uterine bleeding. The Sertoli and Leydig cell tumors are um, composed of Sertoli cells that make tubules and Leydig cells between the tubules. And these cells produce androgens. So you will see hirsutism and virilization, which means basically that you become more of like a, you have more masculine features. The characteristic intracytoplasmic Reinke crystals can be seen here in the picture. And then we have a fibroma, which is a tumor of the fibroblasts and it's a benign tumor and it's associated with pleural effusions and ascites. Now we move on to the male reproductive system pathology. We'll start with penis pathologies. So priaprism is the continuous penile erection unrelated to sexual arousal as it's, and it's a medical emergency as ischemia and thrombosis can lead to gangrene. There's a difference between priaprism and erectile dysfunction. They're two different things. And then we have hypospadias, which is when you have an opening of the urethra on the inferior surface of the penis due to the failure of the urethral folds to close. And then we have epispadias, which is the opening of the urethra on the superior surface of the penis. And it's due to the abnormal positioning of the genital tubercle, also associated with bladder, bladder extra extrophy, extrophy uh, which is basically the bladder located outside the body cavity. And then we have phimosis, which is when you have very tight foreskin on the glands penis. And this can be um, 
physiological and you can put it back. Whereas paraphimosis is when you when the foreskin is trapped behind the glands penis, and this is a urological emergency. Next, we have condyloma acuminatum, which is something we talked about earlier, and it's basically warty growth on genital skin caused by HPV serotypes 6 and 11. It's characterized by cholecystic changes. Then we have lymph, lymphogranuloma venereum, which is a necrotizing granulomatous inflammation of the inguinal lymphatics and lymph nodes. Uh, perianal involvement may result in the rectal stricture that heals by fibrosis, and it's caused by chlamydia trachomatis serotypes L to L, L1 to L3. Next, we have penile cancers, and this is the squamous cell carcinoma of the penis. Uh, the risk factors include HPV serotypes 16, 18, 31, and 33. This is the cause of two-thirds of the cases. Another risk factor is the lack of circumcision, as the foreskin is a nidus of irritation and inflammation if it's not maintained well. Now we have a few precursor lesions, such as Bowen's disease. It's basically carcinoma in situ of the penile shaft or the scrotum. It presents as leukoplakia, and it presents in the fifth decade of life. We also have erythroplasia of quairods, and it's carcinoma in situ on the glands. Bowen's disease of the glands presents as erythroplakia, which is this red picture that you see over here. And then we have bowenoid papulosis, and it's in situ carcinoma and presents as multiple reddish papules. It's seen in younger patients, such as 40 years old, compared to Bowen's disease and erythroplasia of quairods. Next, we have testicular pathologies. We'll talk about cryptoorchidism first, which is basically failure of the testicle to descend to the scrotal sac. The testes develop in the abdomen. It's mostly uni unilateral and it's the most common congenital male reproductive system abnormality as it affects 1% of male births. Um, it presents with very prominent uh, Leydig cells on histology. As for treatment, most cases resolve spontaneously. If they don't resolve by the age of two years old, you can perform an orchidopexy, which is a surgery to bring the testes back to the right position. Its complication is that it can cause testicular atrophy with infertility and has increased risk for seminoma. Next, we have orchitis, which is inflammation of the testes. And the cause for this can be um, a variety of um, infectious uh, agents. The first one is chlamydia trachomatis or Neisseria gonorrhea. It's seen in sexually active young adults and libido is not affected because Leydig cells are spared, uh, but it can cause sterility. It has a risk for sterility. Next is E. coli and pseudomonas and it's seen in older adults caused by the spread of UTI pathogen to the reproductive tract. And then we have mumps, which is seen in teenagers. If less than 10 years old, then orchitis is not really seen. And it does have a high risk for sterility. And then we have autoimmune orchitis, which is characterized by granulomas involving seminiferous tubules. Next, we have testicular torsion, which is basically twisting of the spermatic cord, which obstructs the spermatic vein, leading to hemorrhagic testicular infarction within six hours. This is a surgical emergency that needs to be diagnosed immediately. It causes congenital failure of the testes to attach to the inner lining of the scrotum via the processus vaginalis. It presents with sudden testicular pain and an absent premasseric reflex. Next, we have varicocele, hydrocele, and spermatocele. Varicocele is the dilatation of the spermatic vein and it's mostly left-sided as the left testicular vein drains into the left vein, whereas the right testicular vein goes straight into the inter inferior vena cava. It's also seen in renal cell carcinoma because the carcinoma frequently involves the renal vein. It's seen in large percent of infertile males. It presents as a bag of worms with scrotal swelling, as you can see here in this picture. Next, we have hydros. <clears throat> excuse me, hydrocele, which is fluid collection in the tunica vaginalis. It's basically due to the incomplete closure of the processus vaginalis and the, its communication with the peritoneal cavity in children. In adults, it causes blockage of the lymphatic drainage. 
And this is a picture that you can see of it here. And then next we have spermatocele, which is basically the cystic dilatation of the epididymis, as you can see in the picture over here. Next, we'll talk about testicular tumors. They present with firm, painless testicular mass that can't be transilluminated. You, can, you have to do a radical orchitectomy and um, the mass is not biopsied due to risk of seeding of the scrotum. Uh, the most tumors, are, most tumors are malignant germ cell tumors. So they're classified based on whether they arise from germ cells or sex cord stroma, but lymphoma can also be a cause. So germ cells are mostly malignant, more than 95% of the testicular tumors. Um, their, their subtype is based on tissue made by germ cells. For example, seminoma, which is the most common uh, testicular tumor. And then we have mixed germ cell tumors, which, is, uh, uh, which has a prognosis based on the worst component. And then the placental tissue would give rise to a choriocarcinoma. Fetal tissue would give rise to teratoma and embryonocarcinoma. And yolk sac tumor, which gives rise to endodermal sinus tumor, which is the most common germ cell tumor in kids, just like in the females. And as for the sex cord stroma, they are mostly benign, and we have two types, Leydig cell tumor and Sertoli cell tumor. The Leydig cell tumor produces androgens, so you have precocious puberty in children or gynecomastia in adults. You can see the Reinke crystals on the biopsy. And the Sertoli cell tumor is usually clinically silent. As for lymphoma, it's the most common cause of testicular mass in males above six years old most often bilateral, and most common type is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. If you don't see epithelial carcinoma in testes because they aren't surrounded by epithelium, they're surrounded by the tunica vaginalis. Next, we have uh, germ, cell tumor, germ, germ cell tumors. And as we said before, the they're the most common testicular tumors, more than 95% of the cases, mostly seen between 15 to 40 years old. And the risk factors for it are cryptoorchidism and Klein-Felcher syndrome. So we said um, uh, we have seminoma and non-seminoma. Seminoma is the most common testicular tumor. It's 55% of germ cell tumors. It's highly responsive to radiotherapy, metastasizes late, and has excellent prognosis. Whereas the non-seminomas are 45% of germ cell tumors. They have variable response to treatment. They metastasize early and have a poor prognosis. And these include teratoma, embryonocarcinoma, endodermal sinus tumor, choriocarcinoma, and mixed, gel, mixed germ cell tumors. Now we'll go into a little bit of detail about the germ cell tumors. The seminoma is the most common testicular tumor. It's malignant and has large cells with clear cytoplasm and central nuclei. It has a beta HCG that's rarely increased. It has, as we said before, good prognosis and response to radiotherapy. Next, we have teratoma, which is malignant in females, um, which is malignant, uh, sorry, malignant in males, but in females, it's mostly benign. And it's mature fetal tissue that uh, arises from more than two embryonic layers and it has alpha feta protein or beta, beta HCG increased. Next, we have embryonal carcinoma, which is also a non-seminoma. Peak incidence is around 30 years old. It's malignant and has aggressive, uh, it's very aggressive with early hematogenous spread. It has immature uh, cells that may produce glands and forms hemorrhagic mass with necrosis. Also has alpha feta protein and beta HCG increased. Next, we have endodermal sinus tumor or yolk sac tumor, and it's the most common testicular tumor in children. It's also quite malignant, and you have Schiller Duval bodies on histology, just like we said for females as well. Uh, you have alpha fetoprotein that is increased in it. Um, in adults, it occurs mostly as mixed tumors. Next, we have choriocarcinoma which is um, the most malignant uh, and it spreads early. Uh, the tumor, it's basically the tumor of syncytiotrophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts, placenta-like 
tissue, but the villi are absent. The beta HDG is increased due to the sensitive trophoblasts that produce it. And the alpha subunit of HCG is similar to FSH, LH, and TSH. So you may see hyperthyroidism and gynecomastia along with it. Next, we have prostate pathology. Um, first, I'll talk about prostatitis, which can be acute or chronic. Acute is acute inflammation of the prostate, mostly due to bacteria. And the causes are chlamydia, gonorrhea uh, in young adults, and E. coli and pseudomonas in young adults. Presentation is due to dysuria and fever and chills. On a digital rectal exam, the prostate is tender and boggy. You also have prostatic secretion um, that uh, show a high, a high white blood cell count and a positive bacterial culture. Whereas chronic pr prostatitis is the chronic inflammation of uh, the prostate and it presents with dysuria or pelvic and or lower back pain. And uh, as for the prostatic uh, secretion, it has a high white blood cell count, but it has a negative bacterial culture. Next, we are going to talk about a very high yield, arguably the most high yield pathology of the prostate, which is benign prost prostate hyperplasia. Um, so it's age-related change, most uh, present most often in men more than 60 years old and has no increased risk of cancer. So the pathophysiology behind it is that it's related to the dihydrotestosterone which is made from testosterone by the five alpha reductase in the stromal cells. And DHT acts on androgen receptors in the stromal and epithelial cells resulting in the hyperplastic nodules. The clinical features will be um, problems starting and stopping the urine stream like a dribbling urine stream, impaired bladder emptying, high risk of infection and hydronephrosis, you will have nocturiuria and polyuria and you'll have hypertrophy of the bladder wall muscle and increased risk of bladder diverticuli and you can also have microscopic hematuria present. As for the labs, it's, um, it has a slightly increased PSA which is made by the prostatic glands and for treatment you use alpha-1 antagonist or terazosin to relax the smooth muscle also used as an antihypertensive so that's why it lowers the blood pressure or alpha-1 antagonist uh, such as tamsolosin, and which doesn't act on the vascular smooth muscle and it's used for normal tensive patients. We can also use five alpha reductase inhibitors to reduce the andro androgenic, androgenic uh, stimulation of the prostate and reduce in size. It causes the decreased conversion of testosterone to DHD, takes months to produce effect and it helps with baldness and the side effects will be gynecomastia and dysfunction. And last but not least, the prostate carcinoma. And it's the most common cancer in men, second most common uh, cause of cancer-related death in men. The risk factors are age, race, African Americans have a higher um, risk factor than Caucasians and Asians, and uh, the diet in high saturate, that's high in saturated fats. It presents, um, it's mostly clinically silent. The tumor arises on the posterior peripheral region of the prostate. So you don't see any urinary symptoms unlike benign prostatic hyperplasia. To screen for it, you have to do a PSA and a DRE from the age of 50 years old. For the PSA, the normal serum PSA increases with age due to BPH. Um, you can diagnose it by uh, biopsy. You will see small invasive glands with prominent nucleoli. Ducts may be only one layer thick instead of having basal and laminal layer. As for the grading, it's based on the tumor architecture alone, not on nuclear atypia. Um, so you have to take uh, multiple regions of the biopsy and see what they look like. So because of the multiple regions of the tumor, they have different architectures. You use something called the Gleason scoring, where you take two distinct areas and grade each from one to five. So you have a total score of 10. 
So the higher the grade, the worse the prognosis. And then next we have metastasis. It metastasizes to the it metastasizes to the lumbar spine or the pelvis. These are the most common sites. You will also see osteoblastic metastasis. Um, to treat it, you have to perform a prostatectomy for localized uh, tumors or hormone suppression for advanced disease. So the goal is to reduce testosterone and DHT. So you use a uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone analog, such as lupropride, luprolide, which reduces LH and FSH production, or flutamide, which is a competitive inhibitor of androgen receptors. Thank you for your attention. I would really appreciate it if you guys could fill back the feedback form so that I can uh, know what to work on um, the next time I give a lecture. And I hope this wasn't too much and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.